good morning everyone uh, today's topic for discussion is uh, saliva echo bit of prosthodontics these are the contents that we'll be going through today okay by its definition saliva is a clean tasteless odorless slightly acidic viscous fluid consisting of the secretions from parotid sublingual submandibular salivary gland and the mucous glands of oral cavity as we all know there are three types of major salivary glands parotid submandibular and sublingual and there are various minor salivary glands like labial glands buccal glands minor sublingual glossopalatine, palatine lingual and palatine glands talking about parotid gland it is pyramidal shaped gland uh, it is the largest serous salivary gland and uh, constitutes 25 percent of total saliva it weighs 20 to 30 grams it is situated below external acoustic meters between uh, ramus of mandible and sternocleidomastoid muscle the secretions uh, of its duct that is tensile duct are emptied uh, inside the cheek against the upper second molar teeth some mandibular gland is located at posterior portion of floor of mouth on medial aspect of mandible and it wraps uh, posterior border uh, wraps around posterior border of myeloid it is uh, 10 to 15 grams in weight and it contributes 70 percent of saliva its duct uh, that is bottom's duct opens uh, <clears throat> beneath the tongue lateral to lingual frenum coming to sublingual gland it is the smallest major salivary gland uh, it weighs 2 to 3 grams and constitutes only 5 percent of total saliva it is located in anterior part of floor of the mouth just between mucosa and myeloid muscle uh, it uh, the duct is a uh, duct of ravenous there are multiple ducts which open along the sublingual fold and the largest of them is called as bartholin's duct this and Wharton's duct opens at sublingual carangle uh, then coming to minor salivary glands they are 600 to 1000 in number and it is located beneath the epithelium in almost all parts of the oral cavity except anterior lateral part of heart palate and gingiva it contributes around 10 8 to 10 percent of saliva and opening is via short ducts directly into the mouth and secretion is continuous the secretion is in turn rich in mucin antibacterial proteins and secretory immunoglobulin and uh, whenever the other major salivary gland fails or like one of them fails the other these minor salivary glands can be activated as an alternative uh, then there is a discovery of a uh, new pair of salivary glands which are known as tuberial salivary glands they lie between uh, nasal cavity and throat they are bilateral and it helps in moistening and lubrication of nasopharynx and oropharynx the importance of the discovery of these glands are that whenever a patient is uh, let's say undergoing chemotherapy these glands can be protected at that period of time so the lubrication is still maintained coming to histology of salivary glands uh, it uh, consists of two parts that is the glandular secretory tissue parenchyma or connective tissue stroma so the parenchyma consists consists of secreting cells called as SNI, which can either be serous mucus or mixed the serous secretions are more in proteins and less in carbohydrates and mucus is vice versa for the connective tissue stroma it consists of septa which separates the lobes and it is also responsible responsible for blood supply and nerve supply to parenchyma then there are three classes of ducts which is intercalated striated and excretory and uh, it is uh, noteworthy to mention here that uh, with the increase in age there is decrease in these SNI. SNI are the secreting cells which can lead to dry mouth uh, then salivary glycoprotein and calcium uh, so as discussed uh, parotid gland is the largest serous salivary gland so serous gland will always have neutral glycoprotein secretions while mucus cell uh, mucus cell will have acidic glycoprotein secretions and the more the acidity the more the amount of calcium is needed to neutralize it so uh, naturally uh, mucus cells secrete more acidic glycoprotein which is present in submandibular gland so an increased amount of calcium is required now in case there is some damage to the nerve membrane this calcium can precipitate which can lead to formation of calcium stones also known as silomicrolids coming to classification of saliva there are three ways by which we can classify it according to type of secretion it could be purely serous as in parotid glands of von abner and anterior lingual glands it can be purely mucus like palatine glossopalatine and posterior lingual glands it could be mixed serous which is submandibular it could be mixed mucus which is sublingual and labial buccal glands according to source of secretion it could be a uh, gland specific or whole saliva gland specific is collection and evaluation of saliva from the individual salivary glands while whole saliva contains mixture of not only salivary secretions but also fluids debris and cells not originating from salivary glands 
then based on the collection method it could be stimulated and unstimulated saliva stimulated saliva is nothing but uh, the saliva which is secreted in response to an exogenous stimuli while unstimulated saliva is the resting saliva which does not require any stimulation um, so coming to formation of saliva it uh, basically occurs by in two ways not in two ways it uh, the formation includes a primary saliva formation and then its modification so the primary saliva uh, saliva formation takes place in snr cells while ductal modification takes place in uh, salivary ducts so for the primary salivary uh, formation a uh, neural stimulation is required which could be in the form of uh, sight smell or thought now when the stimulation is re received the rough endoplasmic reticulum uh, expels calcium in uh, calcium ions in cytoplasm now these calcium ions bear a two positive charge on them bearing a two positive charge intracellularly the uh, positive ion concentration is increased so to counterbalance it potassium is pumped out from the cell to the extracellular fluid and chloride is pumped inside from the extracellular fluid uh, to the intracellular fluid through uh, this all happens through sodium potassium chloride pump now since uh, potassium has moved out the positive charge extracellularly is more so to counterbalance it again rough endoplasmic reticulum withdraws the earlier uh, uh, earlier given calcium intracellularly and also the secretory cells pump sodium and chloride to the lumen of the sni now if these uh, sodium and chloride are pumped to the top the solution becomes more hypertonic and uh, to maintain the isotonicity of the fluid the withdrawal of fluid from intracellular and extracellular fluid takes place this process continues till the entire fluid is isotonic so uh, it is essential to remember that the first formed saliva is isotonic but it is not the case with what is secreted first the saliva that is secreted in our mouth is hypotonic so uh, right now we have isotonic fluid and uh, this is only the water component of the saliva uh, but uh, saliva also has a protein component so protein is produced in rough endoplasmic reticulum it moves to golgi complex for modification and over there it is wrapped into something known as transport vesicles these transport vesicles go towards the apex of the membrane uh, where they are now called as zymogen granules these zymogen granules bind with the plasma membrane and are finally re uh, released into uh, fluid into saliva um, so the second part is the ductal modification as I told earlier the iso uh, right now the fluid that we have is isotonic So uh, the saliva which is excreted in mouth is hypertonic. So for its uh, transformation uh, The saliva moves from intercalated duct to striated ducts. These striated ducts are impermeable to water But and reabsorb sodium and chloride and in return gives potassium and bicarbonates in saliva So now the final uh, saliva that is excreted into oral cavity is hypertonic Similarly, uh, the fluid of importance is gingival crevicular fluid. It's a serum exudate that carries all key molecular and cellular components of the immune response that are necessary to prevent tissue invasion by sublingual plaque bacteria. Uh, as you can see in the picture, there is a flow of gingival uh, crevicular fluids in response to degradation products in periodontal pockets, the biofilm filled, uh, uh, found over there. Uh, so why is this fluid important? Because collection analysis of this GCF is of paramount importance and has become a popular approach to investigate localized inflammatory process in periodontitis. And uh, development of periodontitis is also associated with a rise of pH in uh, gingival sulcus to around 8.5. And GCF is shown to be a good predictor of future alveolar bone and attachment loss. Um, so as I mentioned, there is a neural stimulation that is required for the saliva to form. This neural stimulation is uh, uh, covered by autonomic nervous system. There are two pathways for it. It could be efferent and e or efferent pathway. Then we have parasympathetic fibers to uh, submandibular and sublingual gland. Um, so preganglionic fibers arise in superior salivary nucleus and uh, pass through nervous intermediate still facial nerve, cauda tympani, and lingual nerve to reach ganglion for relay. Postganglionic fibers finally carry the sensation to submandibular and sublingual glands. Then parasympathetic nerve supply to parotid gland. Uh, preganglionic fibers arise through inferior salivary nucleus. They go towards glossopharyngeal nerve, then its parts, tympanic branch, tympanic plexus, and finally to lesser petrosal nerve. Postganglionic fibers uh, from auriculotemporal nerve finally uh, uh, relay the sensation to parotid glands.
uh, these were the parasympathetic fibers now coming to sympathetic fibers they arise from lateral horns of first and second thoracic segments of spinal cord and they enter through anterior nerve root and end in superior cervical ganglion the postganglionic nerve fibers are distributed to the salivary glands along the nerve plexus around the artery supplying the gland now i don't know about uh, any one of you but uh, for sure my uh, salivary stimulation is uh, more right now so these are the sympathetic parasympathetic fibers that are that are acting right now so what happens in the process is parasympathetic fibers they secrete acetylcholine which stimulates the cholinergic receptors and this leads to vasodilation and thus profuse saliva and watery saliva is excreted into the oral cavity this saliva has less organic content <laughs> The opposite is true for sympathetic stimulation. Now imagine if you are a hostage in uh, something uh, similar to money heist or probably you are stuck giving a presentation just like I am. So right now the sympathetic fibers are activated. This secretes uh, noradrenaline. Uh, it stimulates your adrenergic receptors. It leads to vasoconstriction. Thus there is less saliva formation which is more thick and mucoid and thus it contains more organic content. So these are the, these, this is how parasympathetic and sympathetic fibers are acting in our body to increase or decrease the salivary flow. Coming to salivary reflex, it could be conditioned or it could be unconditioned. If it is conditioned, uh, then it's a acquired reflex. It is due to previous experience of food. The secretion could be due to sight, smell, hearing, or even thought of food. And it occurs due to impulses arising from eyes, nose, ear. Unconditioned reflexes, they are inborn reflex. They are present since birth. They do not need any previous experience and occurs when any food is placed in the mouth. It occurs due to stimulation of nerve endings in the mucous membrane of oral cavity. Uh, so physical properties, there are two, two types. Uh, it could be unstimulated saliva, it could be stimulated. When unstimulated, the whole salivary flow rate is 0.2 to 0.4 ml per minute and some mandibular and parotid is 0.1 and 0.04 ml per minute respectively. On stimulation, the whole saliva rate increases to 2 to 5 ml per minute and some mandibular parotid gland is 0.8 to 1 to 2 ml per minute. These values are essential because uh, if we have a case uh, of a dry mouth or xerostomia, uh, then these uh, rates are decreased considerably. We can measure those rates as well to determine if the patient is xerostomic or not. Also, it is noteworthy to mention that uh, stimulated saliva contains almost three times more bacterial contents than unstimulated saliva. This is basically due to the fact that uh, imagine if we are giving paraffin uh, uh, to the patient to chew on it, uh, this can erode some of the bacterial biofilms. If the biofilms are eroded, the bacterial content increases more. Uh, then physiological conditions that can affect salivation is fatigue, age and dehydration which uh, decreases while emotion and taste which increases. These were the physiological conditions coming to pathological conditions. The ones that can increase the saliva, saliva flow can be digestive tract irritants, poor fitting dentures, a trauma from surgery while well, the ones that decrease is atrophy of salivary glands irradiation therapy diseases of brain stem and diarrhea uh, then there are drugs that affect the sal salivation to increase it we can give cholinesterase inhibitors like uh, physostigmine or silogogs like pilocarpine while well, to decrease the saliva saliva flow uh, uh, antihistamines like uh, loratadine or drugs for peptic ulcer like omeprazole antihypertensives antipsychotics anti anxiety and antidepressant agents these all drugs are responsible for reducing the salivation so composition of saliva it uh, contains a water uh, water which is 99.5% and solid which is 0.5% the solid consists of organic component inorganic component cellular component gases oxygen uh, gases like oxygen carbon dioxide the organic uh, components consist of enzymes, proteins, non-protein, nitrogenous substances and vitamin uh, like B complex and C. The inorganic components are sodium, calcium, potassium, chloride, bicarbonate, fluoride, phosphate, iodine and magnesium. Cellular components include epithelial cells, white blood cells and microbes. Uh, then saliva also has an uh, essential digestive function. Uh, the enzymes involved are amylase which is present in parotid saliva. It's the first enzyme to initiate the digestion of carbohydrates and it breaks down the starch into hexo sugars like glucose. Uh, this is an important point that amylase is acting to convert the starch into glucose and uh, that I'll cover later. Lingual lipase, uh, it's secreted by von Ebner's gland involved in fat digestion, digestion of uh, milk, fat in newborns, suckling stimulated secretion and acts in synergy with pancreatic lipase. 
Uh, then we have lactoperoxidase, which is innate antimicrobial mechanism and uh, reduces the bacterial growth by blocking bacterial metabolic processes. Uh, then we have lactoferrin, where proteins are secreted by ductal cell. It has bacteriostatic, bactericidal, fungicidal, and antiviral properties. Uh, we have lysozyme, which attacks the cell wall component and kills the gram positive bacteria by cell wall lysis. Uh, lysis. And then we have mucins, which is 40% of carbohydrate in saliva. It has a lubricating function and gives characteristic texture and viscosity to saliva. Coming to uh, salivary immunoglobulins, th these are basically glycoprotein molecules, which are produced by plasma cell. Uh, and it mediates immune response. There are five types G, A, M, D, E. IgG is responsible uh, to enhance phagocytosis, while IgA is responsible for inhib inhibition of bacterial colonization. IgM inhibits microbial adherence, and IgE mediates type 1 immediate hypersensitivity, and IgD acts as a receptor for antigen on B cells. Uh, there is a significant change. In immunoglobulin, in immunoglobulin levels with age, like serum IgG is high in newborn and decreases until six months of age, and then it increases to maximum level till 18 years of age. Then serum IgA is extremely low in newborn and then increases with age, uh, while serum IgM is lowest in newborn and increases to maximum level in 16 to 18 year old period. In general, serum IgG and IgA is positively associated with age, and serum IgM is positively associated with sex being in higher females. Uh, so these features are important to note because uh, whenever we are doing a clinical uh, appreciation of these immunoglobulins, it is not, it is uh, to be kept in mind that in some conditions, these serum can be higher and uh, in some of the conditions, this serum could be lower. Coming to functions of saliva, we have taste and digestion, digestion through all of the enzymes that we have discussed so far. Then we have lubrication and protection. So basically salivary uh, proteins bind to the surface of teeth and oral mucosa and it forms salivary pellicle, uh, which behaves as a protective membrane. Uh, then we have buffering action through bicarbonates and phosphates. It is one of the important actions that we are going to discuss now. Uh, also it helps to maintain uh, tooth integrity and it has antibacterial, antifungal and antiviral effects. Coming to the buffering and uh, buffering action it is basically contributed by bicarbonate phosphate and some salivary proteins uh, metabolism salivary proteins at peptide produce ammonia and urea which helps in increase of ph so a ph at uh, at which any particular saliva ceases to be saturated with calcium and phosphate it is referred to as critical ph and it is uh, 5.5 below this critical ph in organic material may dissolve causing demineralization uh, then bicarbonate buffer system so what basically happens is uh, whenever there is more acidity in the mouth the hydrogen ion concentration increases to counterbalance this hydrogen ion it gets associated with the bicarbonate which is produced actively in saliva on uh, combination of bicarbonate and the hydrogen ion carbonic acid is formed and this neutralizes the uh, ph in mouth uh, then we have age changes in salivary glands they can undergo uh, structural changes which are seen more in some mandibular and minor salivary gland when compared to parotid gland. Uh, they, they are uh, uh, less orderly placed obules, could be shrinkage of cells, could be dilation of ducts or oncocytic transformation. There could be increased adiposity, fibrosis or focal microcalcification with obstruction and chronic inflammation. Also with increase in age, there is decrease in the production of saliva which may lead to dental caries, erosions, halitosis, gingivitis, ulcers, dysphagia, and dysphagia. Uh, then there is an important correlation between the age and uh, composition of saliva. As our age increases, the high molecular weight mucin, something called as Mg1, and then uh, low molecular weight mucin, known as Mg2, that decreases as well as 75% and 10% respectively. So this mucinous decline can have some clinical implications because mucins basically bind with the uh, oral microorganisms and after they are binding they are responsible for, for elimination of, from the oral cavity. If the mucins are decreased this elimination is also decreased. So due to these reductions the oral soft tissue become might become more susceptible to environmental factors which can result in mucosal inflammation as individual ages. Not only with the age it can also happen these reductions can also happen with poor oral hygiene. Uh, then there is a difference between uh, saliva which is present in dentulous patients versus a dentulous patient. In dentulous patient, albumin concentration is more and there is high levels of IgA and IgG. In dentulous patient, S mutants and S mitis predominates while in dentulous patients, S sanguis in CD group and uh, S salivarius in dentulous group pre predominates. 
Saliva is more viscous in dentulous patients, while it is less viscous in dentulous. Salivary flow is normal, while it is increased in uh, CD wearers. Sodium ion con content is less than CD wearers, and uh, a dentulous patient has relatively more. Uh, then saliva, as a fluid, as a biological fluid, doesn't have uh, have a lot of importance in diagnosis as well. And in fact, it has been considered as the mirror image of blood since a long time. And its various component acts as a mirror of body's health. It provides clues to local, uh, various local and systemic conditions. And these salivary components are constantly being explored as markers for early diagnosis of various disease to monitor uh, general health. Uh, the advantage of salivary diagnostics is that it is non-invasive. Even uh, for a limited, in, even in a limited training, it uh, it can take place. It is valuable for children and older patients. It is cost-effective. It eliminates the risk of infection. Uh, it's easy, no pain, no needle prick, and fast technique. And it uh, it is essential. It can uh, be of help in epidemiological studies where screening of large population has to be done. Then these are some of the salivary biomarkers. For instance, in HIV, the IgA uh, is increased in rotavirus. IgA is actually the best marker in acute HIV and HPV infections. IgM is the best marker in periodontal diseases. IgA is increased in breast cancer. CA one five three is increased. In oral cancer, salivary nitrate is increased. In chronic renal disease, salivary creatinine and phosphate is increased. While in cystic fibrosis, salivary calcium and phosphate is increased. So there's a uh, there's a good correlation between salivary glucose and no, uh, as a non-invasive marker for type two diabetes mellitus. So they did a study where they uh, where they wanted to check if a patient is uh, di uh, di a patient has diabetes. Uh, so they uh, so what they did is uh, they collected uh, the blood and unstimulated saliva from each participant and the routine uh, testing method for glucose was carried out via glucose oxidase peroxidase method the results showed high degree and significant correlation between blood and salivary glucose so it could be concluded that salivary glucose is comparable to blood glucose in diagnosing and monitoring type 2 diabetes mellitus and is considered more advantageous than blood due to its non-invasive nature also uh, if anyone is wondering how does glucose molecule come inside the salivary uh, oral cavity, uh, it, it could be due to small molecular size, or it could be due to possible damage in uh, permeability of basement membrane, or it could be due to changes in blood vessels or increased leakage from ductal cells and leakage through gingival crevices. Uh, then coming, uh, uh, not everywhere is the saliva good. A correlation between saliva and dental implants was done. So if there is an infiltration of saliva between implants and implant supported structures, it could actually lead to corrosion. So for corrosion, we need a cathode and we need an anode and we need an electrolytic medium. So in cathode, the reduction of the dissolved oxygen in the electrolyte takes place while at anode dissolution of the metal takes place. So if you're talking about uh, metallic dental processes with over dentures, crowns, uh, so basically the metallic processes part, which is the over denture, it acts as anode and the implant inside the bone can act as a cathode. The electrolytic medium is uh, from salivary secretions are sodium, potassium, uh, chloride, calcium, phosphate, and biocarbonate. This all could lead to corrosion of uh, the dental implant, and salivary contamination also affects the preload preload of uh, implant prosthetic screws. Uh, then uh, saliva as a as a diagnostic marker as a uh, mar uh, marker is also relevant for COVID nineteen. The Diagnosis that is taking place the, the samples are being collected through nasopharynx and oropharynx which are uh, a little disturbing to the patient It is also uh, it also affects the healthcare personnel safety and it is in general less, less acceptable to patients So a correlation was found between the COVID-19 bacteria and saliva So what basically happens is there is a spike protein which is present on the uh, COVID uh, bacteria this spike protein uh, interacts with the ACE2 uh, receptor on the salivary gland cell after its priming in the salivary gland cell it releases COVID-19 bacteria into the saliva and uh, it does have its positive side that uh, there there could be easy diagnosis but there is a risk of disease transmission the saliva is, can then be uh, diagnosed with RT-PCR or immunoglobulin antigen detection uh, then for the collection of whole saliva, there are uh, four methods. There are actually many methods. The four most commonly employed methods is draining method where saliva is allowed to drain of the lower lip uh, into sampling container. Then could, there could be spitting method where saliva is allowed to accumulate in floor of mouth 
and subject spits it out in a graduated test tube every 60 seconds then there could be suction method by salivary ejector which is uh, then transferred into a reading tube or there could be absorbent method where uh, pre weight swab cotton rolls gauze is placed in the mouth and uh, orifices of oral gland uh, then for uh, this was collection for whole saliva where every uh, everything is included but for the gland specific saliva where we are taking it from particular gland for so as an as instance in parotid gland uh, cannulation could be done or lastly cup could be used for some mandibular or sublingual gland uh, cannulation segregation suction method and wolf apparatus can be used for minor salivary glands so uh, paper strip absorption for labial and buccal saliva and pipette uh, filtration paper individual collection processes for pellet and saliva uh, so this is Lashley's cup, which consists of an inner and outer chamber, and inner chamber serves as a collection unit. Uh, then we have collection of some mandibular and sublingual saliva. This is actually an individual process, which is known as segregator, fabricated essentially to collect this uh, particular type of saliva. It consists of a central chamber, which has which uh, holds some mandibular saliva, and there are two lateral chambers which hold uh, sublingual saliva. But uh, it is to be noted that fabrication of this unit is time consuming and uh, this device is not uh, feasible for routine use. Then there are some new methods of collection which includes oral salimetric swab. Uh, so just a swab which is kept under the tongue for two minutes and placed back into the tube. Or there could be saliva collection method which uh, a collection aid which uses a uh, passive drool method to directly collect saliva in the tube. And then there is salivate which uh, includes collection of whole saliva by the absorbent method so the subject over here takes a cotton wool swab placed places it under the mouth for two minutes places it back in the tube and then centrifugation centrifugation is done uh, and finally the fluid is obtained uh, then coming to anomalies of salivary glands it could be developmental obstructive uh, conditions inflammatory conditions neoplastic disease and degenerative condition developmental include aberrant salivary glands aplasia and hypoplasia or atresia obstructive conditions include sialolithiasis mucosal necrotizing sialometaplasia inflammatory diseases like uh, viral is mumps and hiv associated or it could be sialidinitis which is bacterial there could be neoplastic diseases which is benign malignant epithelial mesenchymal and there could be degenerative conditions such as jorgen syndrome ionizing radiations but could be xerostomia so conditions which are associated with salivary gland dysfunction is one of them is hyposalivation or xerostomia which is defined as subjective sensation of oral dryness that may or may not be associated with the reduction in amount of saliva and chemical composition of saliva so it is most common uh, most common cause of xerostomia in elderly is the use of medications uh, on this basis it could be temporary or permanent if it is temporary it could be due to emotional conditions fever or dehydration as in sympathetic fibers are stimulated uh, and it could be permanent where it could be due to silolithiasis or aplasia it is important to remember that xerostomia is not a diagnosis but it is only a symptom with multiple possible causes uh, as mentioned earlier the stimulated and unstimulated flow is uh, reduced in xerostomia to the level of 0.1 to 0.2 ml per minute and unstimulated while uh, 0.4 to 0.7 per uh, ml per minute and stimulated uh, there could be multiple causes of xerostomia some of the developmental causes include uh, water or metabolic loss as in uh, impaired food intake hemorrhage or vomiting or diarrhea it could be of hydrogenic origin as in medications taken radi radiation therapy to head and neck or chemotherapy uh, could be due to systemic diseases like diabetes mellitus and insipidus sarcoidosis hiv Hepatitis C, graft versus host disease, psychogenic disorders. It could be due to local factors such as decreased mastication, uh, smoking, and mouth breathing. And it could be autoimmune like uh, jog Jogren syndrome. And as mentioned earlier, it could be due to medications like anticholinergics, antihistaminics, decongestants, antidepressants, antipsychotics, sedatives, and anxiolytics, and some of the antihypertensives. The clinical features of xerostomia are commonly uh, observed at dry mouth halitosis, dysphagia, dysphonia, difficulty in wearing dentures, increased thirst, oral thrush, thrush and uh, burning tongue. Diagnosis of xerostomia is, uh, could be done via two signs, which is the lipstick sign or the tongue blade sign. The lipstick sign is where the lipstick adheres to the front of teeth and the tongue blade sign, so which is basically when we touch the oral mucosa with the tongue blade, it will stick to the oral tissues. Some of the uh, other causes could be radiation and xerostomia. A common therapy for head and neck cancer is external beam radiation, which causes severe and permanent salivary hypofunction. Uh, so in general, greater than 60 gyri is irreversible and uh, it causes reduced salivary fluent functions to protect uh, 
from uh, radiation induced xerostomia, we, we can give, uh, use radio protective agents or amiphosthine IV 15 to 30 minutes prior to the treatment. Then there is a Joggle syndrome, which is an autoimmune disorder in which body's own cells start to act its own tissues against its own tissues. It could be described as a triad of dry eyes, which is keratoconjunctivitis sicca, dry mouth, which is xerostomia, or rheumatoid arthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, so there are two types of syndrome, primary and secondary. Primary in only involves dry eyes and dry mouth, while secondary involves dry eyes, dry mouth, and systemic conditions. The treatment for it could be ocular lubricants and salivary substitutes. Uh, the salivary substitutes we'll discuss uh, later. Maintenance of oral hygiene has to be done. Frequent fluoride application helps, and uh, the use of medications like Xylogox. Uh, so the consideration that we have to take in impression stage in these patients is uh, we can use petroleum jelly. We can uh, ask the patient to rinse their mouth. We can uh, wet our gloves, uh, and we can use silicone impression material, which is best tolerated. What is to be avoided is zinc oxide eugenol impression paste and impression plaster as they adhere to the dry mucosa and can cause severe irritation or burning sensation. Uh, then there are stimulants for patients uh, salivary gland hypo, hypofunction. It could be topical agents uh, like non cariogenic formulation of chewing gum or citric or uh, citric acid flavored sweets. It could be systemic agents like bromhexine, pilocarpine and semimelin. Uh, it could be electric stimulation, which is uh, that stimulates the nervous mechanisms of uh, saliva or secretion, or it could be acupuncture, which may increase parasympathetic activity, causes a relative uh, increase in salivary flow. Uh, the salivary substitutes uh, are saliva base, which is a 50 ml plastic bottle with spray top. It could be it is used in radiotherapy or Sika syndrome. Then it could be 010, which is a 100 ml bottle with a pump dispenser, which is sufficient for one week of treatment. Uh, it could be AS saliva or thena, which is 50 ml spray and spray onto an under tongue, or it could be a moisturizing gel like biotin oral balance, which is uh, placed uh, half inch length of gel directly on the tongue and spread thoroughly inside the mouth. Uh, then there are some disadvantages of artificial saliva as well. The first of it being uh, poor taste. It lacks sufficient wettability. It can't be selectively targeted to different parts of oral site. It lacks subjectivity and it fails to provide antimicrobial and other functions of natural saliva. Uh, then, as we talked about uh, electrical stimulation, uh, there is this technique called as trans -elect transcutaneous electric uh, nervous stimulation. So, these electric currents are transmitted via the surface electrode pa pads, which are placed on the skin surface, and it potentially stimulates the peripheral nerves to produce uh, various physiological effects. The neuro electrical stimulation, because of the current uh, induced from the pads, is amplified, and it has been reported uh, to reduce the symptoms of xerostomia. So this is one case study uh, they, they have done for TENS, uh, which, in, uh, which includes uh, 80 subjects, and 65 of the 80 subjects demonstrated an increase in the salivary flow rate. So it could be concluded that significant increase in salivary flow rate was observed on application of TENS with minimal or no side effects. Another application of uh, neuroelectrical uh, stimulation is saliva, something called as salivary pacemakers. They are in th three generations, the first being the biggest in size. Uh, it consists of a handheld probe. Uh, which has uh, stainless steel electrodes and a console that uh, housed a battery and the electronic signal uh, generating power source. The probe was applied intraorally as seen in the second picture. And uh, this was applied for a few minutes and it delivered a stimulating signal to sensitive neurons of the mouth to induce salivation. The second generation included a very uh, compact device. Uh, it, can, it basically consists of three parts where the first part is miniaturized electronic stimulator that has a signal generator powerhouse in conducting uh, circuitry uh, and intraoral removal appliance on which this simulator is attached and then an infrared remote control. The remote control could be given to the patient to activate or inactivate the appliance. Uh, so this device is applied into the mouth in a non-invasive manner. Uh, the second generation is non-invasive but the third generation is invasive because this pacemaker can be permanently applied into oral cavity as it can be screwed onto an OCI integrated dental implant which is inserted in third molar area. So this device is placed close to the lingual nerve in third molar region. As for its process, first of all the transmucosal exposure of mandibular bone is done, then preparation of implant bed in mandibular bone is done, then insertion of uh, dental root implant. In uh, D picture you can see the neuroelectric uh, stimulating device which is shown in its applicator. Then finally, it is mounted on the root implant. The last image shows the radiographic uh, image of the implant supported device. 
then we come to palatal salivary reservoir. So this is a case report of a 60 year old patient. This patient complained of missing teeth, difficulty in swelling and mastication and was finally diagnosed as a case of radiation induced xerostomia. It was decided to construct a salivary reservoir complete denture in maxilla containing salivary substitute to relieve xerostomia and uh, aid patient in daily activities. So its fabrication is shown over here till the trying stage uh, till the trying appointment every step every step is similar to what we do in conventional dentures. Uh, so the first image shows the steps after it the palatal contours are recorded using tissue conditioning material then a template of 1mm thick thermoplastic material is fabricated on walk-in cast wax up of reserve oil and lid rim is uh, done with sprue wax then trial dentures are formed after de-waxing the e image shows finished and polished cd with reservoir walls and lid rim on palatal aspect of denture reservoir lid fabricated with 2 mm thermoplastic sheet on duplicated cast of dentures the f image uh, the second last image shows polished surface of maxillary uh, salivary reservoir which is complete denture with salivary substitute the last image shows intraoral view of maxillary reservoir complete denture with salivary substitute so a 0.8 mm hole is made on the most dependent part of the reservoir to aid the saliva to flow uh, then this is a case report where a reservoir denture was used successfully in rehabilitating a xerostomia completely dentulous patient. In the image, you can see maxilla mandibular relationships were recorded and models were articulated. So there are two types of uh, mandibular denture over here, which is first is split mandibular denture, and then there is another base with a clear acrylic resin which con contains reservoir. Figure A shows you the space that is required to accommodate both of these dentures. Uh, with A being the total space and B being the space which can which is used for teeth arrangement. Then figure 2 shows you a clear acrylic uh, base which was fa fabricated with press fit buttons and these are actually the Lego, uh, Lego blocks that are fitted over here. This has made, this has created the reservoir space. This is finally the trying that was done in the patient's mouth. So you can see the split uh, denture over here and uh, it shows split and polished CD the last image. Then counter to hypersalivation, we have hypersalivation, uh, which means presence of excess saliva in oral cavity. The synonyms for it could be hypersaliasis, polysilia, talism, salivary hyperventilation, excess salivation, salism, or siluria. This could be due to overproduction of saliva or due to decreased clearance of saliva or could be due to medical conditions. The treatment for hypersalivation includes anticholinergic drugs like uh, glycopyrrolate and scopolamine radiation therapy it could be surgical intervention where the redirection of some mandibular ducts in parotid ducts posterior to tonsillar uh, pillars take place uh, the next season of sublingual glands or ligation of duct can also be done uh, so the prosthodontic uh, considerations that we have to keep in mind in patients with hypersalivation is that there could be distortion of the impression material in posterior two-third of palate there could be present there could be presence of voids in the impression and uh, excess elevation can also cause the patient to gag while impressions are being made and also after placement of new dentures the solution for it could be massaging the palate to encourage the salivary glands to empty so we can use uh, warm warm gauze pads uh, that can be used to milk palatal glands followed by application of cold pads which constricts the gland opening the palate can also be wet with gauze and irrigation with an astringent mouthwash just prior to inserting impression material can also be used uh, then we have silolithiasis as, as I discussed earlier the correlation of salivary glycoprotein and calcium. So silolithiasis is basically formation of a calcified obstruction within the salivary duct which can lead to chronic infections due to reduced salivary flow. Uh, the symptoms are intermittent with pain and swelling during mastication and the predisposing factors is change in salivary composition with calcium being increased in the uh, salivary fluid. There could be infection or inflammation in the ducts and could be damage to the ductal tissue. The treatment includes silovox, milking the gland, or surgical treatment. Uh, then there is something called a scordatepeni uh, syndrome, which is also known as uh, gustate sweating. So the patient uh, has excess uh, sweating whenever he or she is chewing the food. Uh, this is basically due to the regeneration of the nerve fibers following trauma or surgical division. So some of these nerve fibers from the salivary gland which passes through cordatepeni can get uh, misdirected and join the nerve fibers that supply the sweat glands. So whenever the food is taken in mouth, saliva secretion is associated with sweat secretion. Uh, then for the imaging of salivary gland, we can uh, have plain film radiography. We can have silography, ultrasonography, computer tomography, uh, magnetic resource uh, resonance imaging, or salivary scintigraphy. 
so for the isolation that has to be done during FPD or RPD, it can be achieved by using uh, retraction cords, rubber dam, high uh, volume vacuum, saliva ejector, or anti silo box. And there is one more impression technique that can be used that is tandem impression technique, which is basically two impressions. The first impression is taken to soak soak up the bubbles and viscous saliva which is followed immediately by a second impression to record the tissue uh, then uh, it is important to clean the impression as well so if the patient has thin or serous saliva this type of saliva can just be removed by placing the impression under running water while if the patient has a thick and roti saliva it is difficult to remove the saliva from there so what is recommended that a thin layer of dental stone can be sprinkled on the surface of the impression this stone actually adheres to the saliva and acts as a disclosing agent. So when the impression is placed into running tap water, the saliva can be removed by light brushing with a wet camel hair brush. Uh, then uh, a study on, was done on effect of uh, luting cements in FPD, which showed uh, that uh, the dissolution was, dissolution was uh, maximum for polycarboxylate cement and glass ionomer cement resisted dissolution more than both polycarboxylate and zinc phosphate. Another was on effect of on restorative materials. So for glass ionomer cements, they're very sensitive to moisture, especially during their initial setting phase. Uh, any exposure to saliva can make the cement weak and over drying uh, again can lead to formation of cracks. Uh, then we have the effect on composite resin where contamination decreases the bond strength, physical properties and salivary, salivary yeast traces, which degrade the surface of composite resins. Then coming to the final part of presentation, the role of saliva in denture retention. So what is retention? It's a quality inherent in dental processes acting to resist the vertical forces of dislodgement along the path of placement. So there are various factors that uh, affect the retention like anatomical factors, uh, which include size of denture bearing area. As we know, in maxilla it is 24 centimeters square. In mandible it is 14 centimeters square. So it's more for maxilla. Uh, there could be physiological factors like amount and consistency of saliva. There could be physical factors like adhesion, cohesion, interfacial surface tension, capillarity, and atmospheric pressure and gravity. There could be mechanical factors, undercuts, denture adhesives, suction chambers, and muscular factors. Uh, so coming to adhesion, uh, it's a physical attraction of unlike molecules for each other. So in the image, as you can see, uh, there are unlike molecules, which are, which are uh, denture base and mucosa. So the adhesion takes place between saliva and denture base and between saliva and mucosa. Uh, so it is directly proportional to the area covered by the denture. Uh, so it, for it's more in maxilla and less in uh, mandibular. The dental implications. Uh, so according to Bernard Levin, the most adhesive saliva is thin, but contains some mucus component. And uh, thin and watery saliva is not as effective and thick and ropey saliva can actually uh, tend to build up between the palate, which can cause dislodgement. Uh, then cohesion is the physical attraction of like molecules for each other. So it occurs within the film of saliva. Normal saliva is actually not very cohesive. Hence retention from mucosa interface is more dependent on addition and surface tension. As viscosity of saliva increases, greater is the cohesion, but very thick saliva again tends to build up between the tension. Uh, then there is interfacial surface tension. Uh, it is defined as a tension or resistance to separation possessed by the film of liquid between two well adapted surfaces. So as you can see in the image, when the two glass plates are being pulled, which is a fluid in between, the interfacial surface tension acts in between them, which resists the separation. In the second image, you can see due to the amount of force that we are applying, a concave meniscus is formed. This meniscus will actually create an air and air pressure differential. This pressure differential can also help in uh, retaining the plates over there and this is uh, it's, it plays a major role in retention of maxillary denture in this image you can see the concave meniscus which is formed over here so the cohesive forces result in the formation of this meniscus uh, at the surface of saliva in the uh, border region of the denture when the fluid film is bounded by concave meniscus the pressure within the fluid is less than that of the surrounding medium so a pressure differential will, will exist between saliva film and the air and thereby aids in retention of the denture uh, then there is capillarity or capillary action, which is basically quality or state because of surface tension, which causes elevation or depression of the surface of fluid that is contact with the solid. So whenever there is a close adaptation between the denture and the mucosa, the film of saliva tends to flow and increases its surface contact, thereby increasing the retention. 
then uh, viscosity is equally important viscosity of the fluid is actually the resistance to flow of the fluid so very viscous saliva is associated with relatively poor retention and excess viscosity of saliva leads to thick and discontinuous film between denture and mucosa so air can flow more readily than saliva this offers very little resistance to denture displacement uh, then if we are giving new dentures to the patient they can act as foreign objects now as directed by the body this is a foreign object it can cause stimulation of salivary glands to produce more saliva on excessive salivation patient complains of floating dentures and but it decreases over the weeks after denture insertion so uh, in conclusion uh, i must say that uh, the saliva is a fluid which is long uh, neglected by dentists and it is often ignored by physicians even though the significance of salivary secretions uh, has to be recognized uh, and every effort should be made to provide better therapies to patients suffering from salivary gland dysfunction beyond the simple prescription of artificial saliva these are my references thank you